Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Marilena Zarulia. I am a um, proud Greek, represented the Greek con constituency uh, in Britain, and I'm a senior lecturer in drama at the University of Winchester. And I'm coming with a particular agenda in this uh, conference. I um, I'm writing a book about the relation between Europe and Britain, but from a slightly different perspective. Um, if you're interested in that, come and ask me afterwards. Uh, so I did, I did that uh, sort of marketing pitch for me. Um, my job here is to facilitate a conversation for the next hour um, with some brilliant people who will have uh, lots to, to contribute to the conversations that started yesterday around Europe and theater and Britain and all the politics and aesthetics around that. Um, the topic of the panel is um, Europeanness. How representative is the European work we see in the UK of European work in Europe? Um, and I am joined by, on my right, Yves Lee, playwright, dramaturg and um, sort of in installation artist, uh, um, Melissa Dunn, who, as uh, Sarah uh, said, is a late addition to our panel, but will contribute about uh, the, some of the work that you did this week and perhaps some more stuff that you have to say about theatre in Europe. Sarah Thorn, that's right. uh, from uh, Gob Squad. Um, you will introduce the company in more detail, but you know, Gob Squad, incredibly important. Uh, performance company, and then uh, last but not least, Andrew Hayden, uh, representing the critics, or no, just representing no, himself, no, no, no. <laughs> uh, who will give us some insight into um, these matters from a critic point of view. Um, I think that um, be before this um, panel, I um, emailed the three of the four uh, panelists with some questions just to get us thinking about some issues that I think might be um, useful to, uh, to ponder on um, and to, to really think a bit about what we mean when we talk about Europe and what we mean when we talk about Europe in this country in this very moment and how perhaps the theatre can help us understand something of Europe that we cannot understand if we follow the rather confusing and contradictory news, um, both these days, but also um, for many, many decades. Um, there, is a, there is a history of Euroscepticism. There is a cultural history of British Euroscepticism that I think we need to acknowledge. And there are very many reasons why this is happening. Um, and maybe through our conversations around theatre and translation and language and cultures, um, we can think a bit about what we can learn from the theatre, if any. Um, anything uh, that might be of use when it comes to uh, the particular historical mo moment we inhabit. Um, so we will chat here for about uh, 40 minutes, we'll see, 35 minutes. We want to allow plenty of time for discussion with the audience. Um, so without further ado, I will start asking Sarah just to tell us a bit about Gob Squad. Um, about the ways in which, as a collective of seven artists who are uh, British and German, you think about yourselves as European uh, company. Is that something that matters to you? Um, or is it, does it matter to you in this particular historical moment? And also maybe think a bit about specific projects, their reception here versus in continental Europe. So. Uh, hello. Um, I've, I've actually written a tiny bit because I saw that we need to be succinct because there's not so much time mm -hmm. and I waffle. <laughs> so uh, I thought this would help. Um, so first of all, I'm just going to talk a little bit about who Gob Squad is and then um, we'll see what happens. So um, Gob Squad are a group of seven artists, four from the UK and three from Germany. We are a collective, which means that we work collaboratively without a director. We met through a student cultural exchange between Theaterwissenschaft course in Gießen and the Creative Arts course, which was an interdisciplinary course at Nottingham Trent University. Gob Squad have been making and touring work internationally for 25 years. Um, we see ourselves as part of the independent free scene which means we are not tied to a house or institution. We work with two producers, one based in the UK and one in Berlin, 
and we produce our own work. Um, we're involved in all aspects of the work, the seven core members, um, including devising, performing, directing, translating and producing. Um, so to, to add a little bit to what you just said there, um, uh, I just want to say that when we started, we were seen as extremely British. 25 years ago, we were seen as... Um, we took the work to Giessen, um, which is a, a performance festival in... Uh, a performance course in Germany, and they used to run a little um, festival there uh, called Discus, and we were seen as British as fish and chips. <laughs> Even, we, we, we were just like, yeah, you are like so British, you know, and um, the work we made then was labelled as live art mm -hmm. and uh, we were part of, that's where we had to apply for money if we were applying for money and the live art department had a tiny budget and uh, we were part of the first live art festival in Berlin. Um, we didn't really care how critics, venues and funding bodies labelled our work as long as we got to make it. Um, now we're labelled as post-dramatic theatre and uh, this label um, being coined by Lehmann, a German, we seem to all of a sudden become German. <laughs> Maybe we're as German as Currywurst, I don't know. Um, but we do fine with that, you know, we do see ourselves as European. Um, the thing that's quite interesting is if there was ever a festival in Europe, um, focusing on British work, or in Germany or England, focusing on British work, we didn't ever get asked to perform. Mm -hmm. And if there was ever a festival focusing on German work, <laughs> we never got asked to perform. And actually, we fall in between, um, which is fine by us, it's sort of neither flesh nor flesh. We have always been... Um, comfortable in that liminal space um, and I'm very happy to sort of reject that binary position um, uh, and that's how we I, I, and that's how it can feel when we identify when we're asked to identify as German or British which we're constantly asked to do um, and up until recently in our 25 year history we've always declared that well actually maybe we're more European um, and that's always been the non-binary position. But actually, right now, what seems so strange is that it's now become part of this, in the UK, this binary conversation, which feels incredibly weird. And um, we're readjusting to that. And um, we're trying to find a new position where we feel comfortable. Um, I'm sure along with everybody else and we have no idea how it's going to pan out and um, we just know that we, we like being uh, in the liminal space. Mm -hmm. So maybe we'll have to invent a new word like Thomas Lehman did. Like Lehman did. <clears throat> anyway, so that's enough for now from me. I think there's a lot of other people. Great. Thank <laughs> you, Sarah. Brilliant. Um, Eve, if I may ask you, you've, um, you've worked across different cultural national contexts here in Britain in fringe and non-fringe venues and as, as a playwright and then um, you've made work in Germany in installation context um, and you've actually even worked in Greece from what I saw um, in, uh, in the experimental stage of, yes. of the National Theatre. Um, so I'm curious to hear from you about again how this process of traveling and making work and collaborating with artists across different countries have informed a your work and of course you can you can talk about specific examples but also your sense of yourself as an artist and whether you find um, certain uh, contexts more comfortable to work in mm -hmm. um, or certain contexts more productive for you um, you know, from, from for, say, from an academic point of view, for me, being Greek working in Britain is an excellent position because I'm always occupying that kind of outsider position. Do you find that sort of um, search for being an outsider uh, productive in your own work? 
um, and what's the role of language and translation, if any, um, in, in all that? I yes, I do find it very productive. Um, I'm I am American, but my uh, family is Ukrainian, and mm -hmm. I moved to the UK when I was 18. So I guess for a long time, like in a funny way, like we, I'm from New York, and uh, some of you may know, like it's very um, obviously there's a really strong multicultural immigrant culture there um, uh, and like all of my friends like we weren't like I just thought I was Ukrainian like my friends thought they were Puerto Rican Chinese like you know what I mean like uh, they there wasn't like the hyphen American that mm. follows it like sort of wasn't a thing when I was growing up and then I moved here and I discovered that I was American <laughs> and um, and I think in a way um, yeah being being here, uh, like, I think also, uh, yeah, like, it was such a blessing to move here so young, because when you live in another country, as many of us know, um, uh, you begin to see that a lot of the things that you think of as really fundamental to kind of reality um, are actually really cultural and marginal and, and kind of movable. Um, and that's such an amazing thing um, to sort of feel so viscerally, to be surrounded. I mean, it, I, honestly, it also kind of freaked me out. Like, it was, I felt like I was crazy or something because people were insisting on these things being, like, true, obviously, always, forever. And I was like, no, what? No. Um, but I was the only person in the room saying that. And I'm sure all of you, like, listening to these experiences, you can see how that's such a valuable position for an artist to be put in. For one thing, um, I feel like a lot of my practice involves um, kind of seeing what's enjoyable about breaking dramaturgical rules mm -hmm. uh, or putting people in uncomfortable or surprising positions, mm -hmm. um, which obviously comes really directly from that. Mm -hmm. um, and also, um, yeah, it's just, um, I don't know, to be alone in that way, I think, invites a kind of hunger for connection, which obviously the assumption that connection is part of what theater is about is itself very English language, um, very British, American, Australian, Canadian. But so am I, so there we go. <laughs> uh, so you, just to be clear, you, you see this hunger for connection as a kind of fundamental element of what we understand theatre to be in an Anglo-Saxon Yes, world. exactly, what many like English language theatre practitioners assume mm. theatre to be about. Great, that's a great idea. Maybe we can return to that. Um, Andrew, from a sort of critic point, a critic's point of view, and someone who has um, reviewed work produced here, British work or European work that has come in this country, but also has written about work that you've seen in the continent. Do you find that this um, long-standing uh, binary between European and British theatre uh, is still uh, legitimate, is still holding? Um, you know, there, there was a time that this kind of um, distinction seemed more credible. But there's been a lot of, mm. the, at least from an academic point of view, perhaps. Um, but by now, it seems that there's been so much traffic. I mean, Ben Fowler gave an excellent paper yesterday thinking about some of that translocal uh, sort of movement between uh, directors in between Britain, Germany, the Netherlands. Um, We've seen a lot of that. We've seen a lot of that in the Barbican. We've seen a lot at the Lift. We've seen a lot in this in this city in London. Um, can we talk about uh, British theatre as European theatre by now? Um, can we include British theatre in that kind of sort of term? Do we need the distinction? Who benefits from that distinction? And what's your own experience as as a as a critic? That's a lot. Of I know, I'm just throwing stuff at you just to kind of get you going and I will, I will, I will press a specific points. Um, well, I'll say what I was going to say anyway and see how much yeah, that yeah, addresses yeah. that. Um, I mean, I, I am not representative of any other, any other critics at all. I, um, 
in 2007, I was asked, I was invited to be part of a, a sort of a young critics, I mean, I wasn't that young, but a young critics thing, um, which toured around 10 European theatre, 10 European theatre festivals uh, in over 2007, 2008, and we did a workshop at each one. Um, and up to that point, I'd been pretty much drilled in the same school of English theatre criticism as everybody else. Um, and you'd see mostly British work, and the, the work I'd seen that was European was always framed in a very specific context, I think, at the time. Um, like, you knew where you would go and see European work. It was the Edinburgh International Festival, Manchester International Festival, uh, the Barbican, sort of the Young Vic, but that's a different thing which we'll talk about later. Um, and that's where you'd go and see European work made by Europeans, of which Britain was not a part. Um, and it was, you know, noticeably different. And it was interesting that it was, it's all, it almost always offered with kind of no context for me, like, other than that it's European. But because, like Eve says, we have this idea of theatre that is, you know, peculiar to our country, um, which does have a lot of rules and a lot of pre presuppositions. Um, you kind of come out sometimes thinking, oh, well, they, they did that wrong. And um, I think that's a thing that a lot of British critics come up against when reviewing European work, is that they, they somehow think that it's British theatre done wrong. Um, you know, it's like, there's a the production of Tom. I did this. I I did it tons. There was a Thomas Austin Myers production of Blasted at the Barbican in 2006 when it transferred there after it opened a couple of years earlier in Germany. Um, he he had the guy from the Lives of Others playing Ian the journalist, and Ian the journalist in Blasted the text is kind of a violent working class racist thug, and the guy from the Lives of Others was dressed in this nice suit and he sound, seemed like a kind of a, a depressed architect, <laughs> a very middle class. But it, I mean, he, he still said all the words. I mean, it was actually quite a pure production, but the, the social context was so completely different. I thought, Austin, I, I don't, I, how, has he, how has he done this? Um, and that was, you know, that's mild by German theatre standards of how to, uh, how to approach a text. Changing the class of one character is, is very, very minor. But uh, I still thought, oh, that's not true to the text. And then a year, a year later, I went to this first, this, the first of these festivals and um, saw work that made absolutely no sense in a British context, which had no antecedents, no kind of... And a lot, a lot of it was actually, this is another interesting thing, this kind of the live art track, which I think is actually quite international and within which British work can move relatively equally. And there, there seems to be a common language. But then there's the kind of state theatre work and British state theatres and state theatres from other European countries seem to have very different presuppositions. And so, so at, at the festivals where there was a lot of live art, you kind of knew where you were and you were like, ah, okay, this is sort of... Although live art seems to be mostly a British term now, and everybody, like they say, free scene. Yeah. Or, they, or they just call it theatre. That yeah. way. They, they, they can put it on the stage of the National Theatre, but it is live art to English people. But they just see it as theatre, and you're like, wow. Oh. So that's weird. That's a thing. Um, that's to, to get, Yeah, it's an important thing. Like you've, you've been on stage yeah. at like the Volksburg exactly. in Berlin, which is like, yeah. it's like the Young Vic, you know, and there's like this crazy live art show, as far as the English mind is concerned, isn't it? And, but um, so, yeah, I'd seen all this stuff and then realised that the English way, like Eve says, isn't, isn't like everything you're told is true is true a bit in England, but not, not even remotely true in Germany. And they, um, like, and I, um, there are probably ways of codifying that. Just shut me up after five minutes, by the way, I'm just babbling. Um, like, the thing that like, Slovenians and ex-Yugoslavians say is that we're addicted to stories rather than philosophy or kind of ideas. And I think that's the Germans think that as well. Um, they think that about British people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the idea that, like, you see, we see. So we saw a production of this festival in Sweden. It was a Swedish production of the Bitter Tears of Petra von Kant, the Fassbinder film, and um, and I liked it. I thought it was good. They'd just done the, the story. They'd done the plot, 
they had acting in it, it was good. Um, <laughs> you know, you standard, standard sort of requisites for success in an English theatre. And um, yeah, when we came out and my, my Slovenian critic friend was like, oh, they did nothing with it. And I was like, they did it well. It's like, they, what did they add to it? Um, and that, that idea of adding to it is, is something that a lot of Northwestern European countries particularly, or I don't know, where, where's Yugoslavia? It's not Northwest <laughs> at all, is it? Southeast. Um, sort of Southeast. Well, it's nowhere um, because it doesn't exist in some way. Yeah. Where's Yugoslavia? Yeah. But, um, yeah, so there's that. And then, because we had this question about representation, um, very, very quickly, I thought, when I read the question, I thought, that's going to take about three, three minutes to answer how representative is the work we see in England of European work? Not. Um, and we know what we're used to seeing. We see some translations of, say, Schimmelfenig, um, Maris von Meyenberg, David Gieselman, a couple of other big-hitting European playwrights, not counting Yasmina Reza, obviously. Um, and then, we, in production terms, we see, it's very interesting how Anglo, the choices of things that we see brought over us. So we saw, you know, we saw Thomas Austin Myers blasted, for example, you know, it's like getting up, it's this sort of vanity we have to bring back other people's interpretations of our things. Uh, like we get Nina Gawa's, you know, Japanese, but we get Nina Gawa's Shakespeare, not his, Ninagawa is something Japanese quite often. Um, and now, because there are British directors working abroad as well, quite often our international work that we see in Barbican is Katie Mitchell's German show from such and such, or you know, Katie Mitchell's French show from such and such, or Declan Donnellan's He Worked with Some Russians show. And, um, <laughs> so, and, and if, if they're forced to use the work of a European director, they tend to get him to do something that was British. Although the, the, the amount of British new writing on European stages, certainly in comparison to the amount of all of European work on contemporary work, sorry, I mean, obviously Chekhov, Ibsen, blah, but, um, but the amount of Simon Stevens plays in German, for example, at any given moment, you know, puts to shame the number of Marius von Meinberg, et cetera, et cetera, plays ever seen in England. Um, so, it, I mean, it is representative in a way, insofar as we are a net exporter. But there are, I mean, there are lots of, even in the state theatre level, there are so many sort of types of work that I think are barely, barely making an impression here. And it's always been sad to me. Um, but the, the, the idea of ad adapting a novel not as drama is, um, is one which I think we miss completely. And I think it would be great if they actually transferred some of that. Um, and the idea of having like what is live art style work, I guess. Um, but at a state theatre level, we don't see nearly enough of that transferred. And also the other thing we really miss out on is national classics from other countries. Um, like everybody's got a kind of, I mean, Shakespeare, obviously, Chekhov, obviously, Ibsen, obviously, Goethe and Schiller to an extent, obviously. But there are like these sort of second tier playwrights, like I guess our restoration playwrights and the Germans have a canon, the Polish have a canon, you know, every, every country in ex-Yugoslavia have these kind of playwrights who are kind of their national playwright, who we never see anything by. And it would be worth seeing that stuff in translation or transferred in original production, so that's, I think that's the biggest thing that we miss. Um, Something about the sort of the place of the, of the European canon, but the canon that we don't know, the Latin yeah, yeah, canon yeah. It's that kind is of the, the national canon yeah. within the a big European game, mm -hmm. which we do know. Um, yeah, I think I'm going to pause yeah, you here kind of so that we um, carry on, but it's quite a lot of, of rich sort of things to think about. Um, Melissa sort of kind of uh, bring in some of those questions around Europe, exposure to European theatre, European traditions. Um, maybe you can think a bit about those questions in relation to yourself mm -hmm. and your own work and more specifically the work that you've been doing in the uh, in the festival this week in terms of um, whether for you directing a European play um, presents more challenges and what sorts of challenges mm -hmm. um, compared to say producing work that comes yeah. from here. I mean <clears throat> 
just to give uh, my background, um, I, I'm Scottish. My family moved to England when I was 14, so I've now lived longer in London than I, ha than I ever lived in Scotland. Um, uh, and it's it's probably only like a distinction that like matters within the UK. Like I, like whenever I go, I, like I was directing a Romanian play, and when I sort of corrected someone who said I was English, no, I'm Scottish. They said that's the same thing, um, <laughs> which I I am completely fine with. I'm I'm over it. Um, but another, <laughs> whatever. Um, but like another Scottish person might get quite offended by that. I'm over it. Um, uh, I had, I had a, first of all, I had a fabulous time working on the two readings I did at the festival this week, um, and uh, sort of working as a director, I feel like my practice kind of doesn't always match up with my taste. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, I made it a lot of my practice is very kind of standard, psychologically realist, um, Stanislavski based. One actor once referred to me as the Tesco Value Theatre Director. Um, <laughs> he doesn't work as an actor anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Genuinely. Uh, <laughs> nothing to do with me. Um, um, and, and that kind of like doesn't sort of, that's never sort of been me or matched up with my taste in plays or in theatre. Mm. Um, when I was doing my undergrad, I sort of worked a lot with. Uh, I went to Aberystwyth University where we had the Centre for Performance Research, uh, which was very vibrant at the time. I sort of worked with them for about a year on and off, doing a lot of their work. Um, and in all honesty, uh, I think I would go to see more European theatre work. Um, I would prep. Uh, I think for me, it always comes down to sort of like resources and I spent a lot of time this week thinking about neoliberalism um, because of The Drive which was one of the readings on Tuesday night which is literally called a neoliberal comedy. Um, so I've spent a lot of time think this week thinking about capital and what you do and what you exchange, artistic capital, professional capital, um, creative capital, the rest of it. Um, I think the thing that I really got out of this week and I think when working on the festival, sort of, Sarah didn't really give us a brief, but she kind of said a couple of things that I sort of, which were, uh, if you can play with the idea of what a reading is, um, which I thought, okay, I'm gonna let that sit there. And very, very simply, she sort of just said, a lot of people don't think European plays are fun. I'm paraphrasing you horribly, but um, to get away from that idea that like f for, it was important for the company to have fun and the audience to have fun. Um, really, really simple idea. And actually the actors in the context of that sort of very much took that on board and owned that and mm -hmm really inhabited that and I think there's a real reluctance on the part of British practitioners to ask actors to work in ways that aren't standard, mm -hmm. um, to ask actors that, have, that maybe come from a very specific kind of career track and background. Mm -hmm. So many of the actors in the reading Phantom of Normality last night have done, have been on it places like, you know, Chichester, Festival Theatre, um, the National Theatre, of Great Britain, there's lots of them, um, the night of Great Britain, and I think there's perhaps a reluctance on the part of certain directors and practitioners to invite your actors to do things that are maybe outside their comfort zone, or that at a very basic level will maybe make them look a bit silly or embarrass them, and actually they were all, all the actors were completely up for it. Mm. I don't know if that answers your question at all. I, no, absolutely. I mean, I think it's interesting to think a bit about training and education. I mean, that's something that sort of is in my mind since yesterday, actually, about the 
we talk about the traffic of directors and plays and playwrights, but we but we maybe need to think about the traffic of um, academics and actors and directors who have been educated, say, here, and then return to their own countries and take some of the principles of British theatre making, whatever that is, into European context. And I'm looking at you, Sarah, thinking about this sort of collective that, that, that you made in the Gob Squad, which was first branded British and now um, then became we don't German. Know what we are and really. you, you have like this yeah, crisis we're of in identity. A, we're in an interim place. <laughs> but, but you said that you started by sort of through an exchange. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Which is a kind of educational yeah. uh, context, isn't it? Yeah, well, it, uh, ironically, um, part of the exchange, I mean, um, of course, there was, of course, free movement backwards and forwards mm -hmm. to Giessen. Mm -hmm. um, and then when we took our, our work to the festival in Giessen, they um, were very interested in what we were doing because it was interdisciplinary we rejected well actually we didn't actually when some people say things like um well, i like to break the dramaturgical rules i think we didn't know what they were <laughs> so we didn't know what we were breaking because we, we didn't know what the dramaturgical world we didn't know how to perform you know so we didn't know what we were breaking yeah. so we were taking this work there and it was kind of seductive to these people who were working in a very academic course Mm -hmm. uh, Giessen's very, very academic. Um, is, is Giessen the place where Rimini Protocol Yes, Rimini, they from? were all there. Yeah. They were students when mm -hmm. we were going over mm -hmm. with this work. Yeah, Rim oh, Rimini, Shishi, Pop, yeah. all that, yeah, yeah, all of them. And uh, so some of them really liked the course, the idea that we were working in an um, interdisciplinary way and the way that we were working was very uh, practice-based as opposed to, you know, it's pra theory, practice, theory, practice rather than just theory. And so they applied, some of them applied for the Erasmus. Erasmus, what's going to happen to that? <laughs> you know? So they applied for the Erasmus and they came over and spent a term uh, with us. We were now towards the end of our time at university. And um, I was a mature student, I didn't go to university until I was 30. So I was very eager to grab all of these great people and I wanted to leave with a company. Um, so we um, sort of grabbed some of the people from Giessen and said, come and be with us. Mm -hmm. um, so that wouldn't have happened had it not been for that cultural exchange. Yeah. It wouldn't have happened had it not been for Erasmus. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that educationally, um, one of the things I was thinking about yesterday was... Um, the idea of working in an interdisciplinary collective fashion, in the sense of we don't ever see ourselves as performers, producers, act, um, directors. We see ourselves as trans. All of these things, and um, not and um, and yesterday when we were talking about the translation, I was really thinking about um, when we were asked to work with um, uh, a, a playwright called René Polish. He's um, based in uh, the folk, he was based at Volkspooner. Mm -hmm. And René Polish asked us to work with his text. And um, first of all, we were like, we don't work with other people's texts. We write our own text. And then we thought, come on, if what we're doing is expanding our practice constantly, let's. Mm -hmm. But only if you become part of our collective mm -hmm. for this process. Mm -hmm. And he decided that he would do that. So. That's how we were able to um, work, is that we said, well, instead of us working here and you working there, we work collectively. And so he came to the rehearsals. He came and, been, and he would write work text for us mm -hmm. as we were making and devising the work. Mm -hmm. We'd never, it was a beautiful process. He's an amazing mm -hmm. writer. So it was an absolute privilege. Mm -hmm. And within that, we are working with German and English, and we work in English. We rehearse in English all the time. Mm -hmm. But there's a constant translation going on, not just with language, but also with each other. You know, the translation isn't just about, it's about how we communicate with each other. It's about taking on board each other's individual needs and listening and responding. Yeah. And um, so in that context, while working with René, we were constantly um, 
um, so he, he's, some people, I, I'm not even sure if he defines himself as a writer or as a director, I don't think he cares. Mm. It's, know, it's like, interesting, isn't it, because he's, yeah. he's, he's like this thing, that, another thing that we don't have in England, except like maybe Howard Barker. It's like this kind of one man porter unit who writes his texts, directs them, yeah. and has, you know, has a fairly impressive kind of style. Really I mean, impressive. When, when, yeah, yeah, when was yeah, your yeah. collaboration? Our collaboration, it? Um, it was called, he, he did these things called Prata Saga. Uh -huh. And um, when he, the fox winner was at the Prater, Prater yeah. yeah. And um, I, I'm rubbish with time. Mm -hmm. A while ago. Yeah. So <laughs> 2004, five, yeah. six, seven. Ish. Time. Yeah. Yeah. I saw. I it's, saw the thing about the chorus is so wrong, which had all the Victorian ladies. Oh uh, yeah, 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 that, yeah. Yeah. So Prater's so, anyway. So we worked with him, and and um, but what I'm trying to say is this practice. Mm -hmm is something I wonder in universities yeah. and in courses, you know, places like here, to sometimes have these disciplinary practices, interdisciplinary practices might be interesting, to say, okay, we're going to get a writer, a translator, a director and some performers together, but what you're all decided what you're called, and we're going to make a piece together. And you don't all have to be in it, but this moment of devising yeah. where we have to communicate with each other the work will then be translated exactly how the writer wants it to be translated yeah. because they'll be in the room yeah. the performers will be able to negotiate what is needed and I think that that's a way of working that is not the I also don't want to get into this opposition yeah. I don't want to get into the, because I think that's obviously something super attractive to a playwright who, want, who, who enjoys the solo career, of, you know, like enjoys working mm -hmm. and individually on things and, 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 and then a director. And, and that is a way of telling stories that clearly has its value. And I really reject these binary oppositions of putting them against each other. Yeah. It's just another way, yeah. another way of working may be something to introduce at times. Absolutely, I, I think this sort of principle of collaboration, at least in my experience, is something that is thriving in British sort of drama departments. Yeah. It's certainly something that uh, those of us who teach in, in UK universities, we are pushing our students a lot. And actually, I've seen the impact of that kind of principle in a lot of practice in Greece, where yeah. a lot of people were trained here and returned, and that sort of collaborative, in the room, everyone contributed, um, principle came from Britain, so I'm going to defend something of British theatre mm. that perhaps certainly did not exist in, in, in the Greek example. But I was wondering before we open to, um, to the audience whether um, Eve and, and Melissa, you can think a bit about your own ways of working and sort of the place of um, collaboration and sort of exchange and sort of complex process of translation um, that are at work when, when you do sort of particular project. Um, yeah, uh, I'm, unfortunately, I can't, I can't think of any principles. I can only think of examples. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, That's good. <laughs> That's what you do. The, the people who do um, give us examples and then come up with examples. <laughs> so um, something that happened that was really hilarious and sort of mortifying to me um, uh, there is a play of mine that's actually it's going to be on at the Bush next month, which is so scary. Uh, it's called The Trick. Um, and it's there's a sequence, and oh my god, every th single thing about the process of writing that was like an intercultural mishmash of like hilarity and horror. <laughs> um, but um, uh, basically, uh, The Trick is a play that was treated as really abstract uh, when it was, it was commissioned by the RSC, and they were like, well, it's very wild, but like, we might just do it. Um, uh, it's going on at the bush, so we'll see how that, how that works out. Um, uh, and uh, then um, it was given a reading at a theater in Poland, and there is a sequence in it where the narrative sort of stops. Again, people who are familiar with many European theaters, including Irish theater, perhaps will recognize this. Um, the narrative stops, um, and uh, somebody tells an Isaac Bashev a singer story. Uh, which, um, when I read it, um, really felt like a story about aging and kind of the purpose of life, like the things that give life meaning. But in Poland, 
stop, first of all, stopping the narrative to tell a folk story is a very conservative thing to do on any number of levels. Like, first of all, it's a very familiar dramaturgical uh, technique. So on that level, perhaps it's small C conservative. Um, and then also the fact that it was set in like a rural village. Uh, when I heard the creatives talking about it, I was suddenly, I could suddenly imagine myself if history had played out differently and I'd sort of landed in Poland instead of the US being like, oh my God, we're hearing about the shtetl again, <laughs> great. <laughs> um, uh, and it was just, um, uh, yeah, it was just really, um, uh, yeah, shocking and delightful and mortifying and wonderful. Um, uh, and another thing, another kind of example um, is, uh, oh God, this was extraordinary. Um, I made a piece of sound art. I, I was, I collaborated with some people on a piece of, of sound art. It was based in this Borstal in Bulgaria. Um, uh, and, uh, it was, we, it was a very strange place, as you could imagine. Um, there was a lot of very intense graffiti, uh, uh, and the gym teacher from the old Borstal still lived in the village and like came to us and started talking about this, um, how it was actually a wonderful place. Uh, and how the children were treated very well, and then started giving us these lists of invented, like, tortures, essentially, that he'd given the children. Um, uh, being like, oh, but it was so modern, it was so forward-thinking. Um, and it was really interesting, the people that I was working with, it was me, two Germans, <coughs> and a Bulgarian. Um, the only person who spoke Bulgarian was the Bulgarian. Um, and just trying to figure out an ethics of representing what had happened there uh, and a way of locating our voices in a way that felt um, genuine uh, and respectful um, was just really interesting because each of us had really different understandings. We were also interdisciplinary. It was a choreographer, a documentary filmmaker, a translator, and me. Um, and we just all had completely different ideas about uh, what was possible to say mm -hmm. in that sort of context. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you mean you had conflicting ideas in that? Yes. Yes, you had to negotiate yes. that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Interesting. Thank you. Was, can I ask a question? That's a very really interesting. Was the, was the guy, the gym instructor, was his, got, was his view even remotely shared by any other Bulgarian, or was this kind of not no <laughs> no all of the it was it was a really he was also interested his translator was female and he kept completely talking over her and she was like doing her best to like, <laughs> um, uh, uh, and yeah and like all of the like you could just see like the physical difference in the people in the room who spoke Bulgarian and the people mm -hmm. who didn't because the people who were like the people who spoke Bulgarian were like this and the people who didn't were like uh yeah, yeah. yeah much like the translator was that a commission project or was it a it was a funded by the I applied to do it um but it was funded by the Goethe Institute uh Bulgarian, mm -hmm. uh, and the Institut Français Bulgarie and also the like it was curated by the producer of the Maxim Gorky Theater, right. uh, or of the Studio Ya Maxim Gorky Theater in Berlin, who mm. is Bulgarian. Oh, right. yeah. Or, yeah, she's on, mm. I'm not sure, I think she's moving on to, but anyway. Thinking about all those structures supporting yes, these and, kinds of projects, maybe. That's... And also, it's not an accident, I feel, that, or it's something that's very common in a lot of European work, mm. um, that the money somehow comes from Germany and France. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> before we open, any any sort of more examples or any anecdotal sort of things that, that you <clears throat> would like to share? I mean, just working on a, the, the Phantom of Normality, like which was last night, which um, is really worthwhile reading. Um, it's 11 pages of what felt at the time like quite impenetrable text um, and trying to represent that. So, we, we, we did some flamenco, uh, really, 
Um, there's a moment in it where a lonely woman um, imagines two flamenco dancers. And, uh, you know, sort of not within my skill set. So the lonely woman was actually like a very, very gifted dancer and movement director, uh, Jenny Jackson. So herself and the actor spent an hour and worked out some moves. Uh, and then another member of the company just casually mentioned that they could play a bit of Gypsy Kings. <laughs> And then he came to rehearsal the next day and just busted out some like <coughs> flawless classical Spanish guitar. Um, and so what could have been quite a, a static kind of <coughs> boring moment in a reading actually oddly became this really quite transcendental moment where everybody forgot where they were. Um, we also added a lot to the text, um, which I don't know. I think, I'll be brutally honest, like the writer of that text wasn't with us mm -hmm. and wasn't able to come. So it was quite different than with The Drive where it was one, like elect by Alexa Okinovich. He came over, he came over with his baby. The baby came to the rehearsal, the baby came to tech. It was, it was a very different experience. Mm -hmm. Whereas um, having gotten very, very fond, we got very fond of the stage directions in the phantom of normality because there's not a lot of dialogue and we wanted to kind of represent what the text was trying to say mm -hmm. and then we also added a bit more dialogue um not an i am amazed so i added the line i am amazed a couple of times just and i am lonely mm -hmm. and we sort of gave ourselves a bit of a break because actually there was a lot going on within the text so about I think it was about 10, 15 minutes in, we just opened the fire exits and like had a glass of water and brought the house lights up just because there was a lot going on attention span wise. Mm -hmm. I tend to drift off myself after 10 or 15 minutes. So it was quite a pleasant experience. Um, and it, it wouldn't have been possible what we did without that company of actors mm -hmm. and their willingness to do that. Please uh, join me thanking our great panellists for some really insightful comments and ideas and experiences and yeah, it's just after 11 o'clock so uh, 